to say a few words about our most precious teacher and his extraordinary life. I don't think I can actually conceive or understand the depth and breadth of his qualities and accomplishments. But I will reflect on some aspects that I was able to directly experience and add to the wonderful stories that students and teachers have shared over these last few weeks. Anyan Rinpoche and Tulku Jigme Wangdok Rinpoche already spoke on a deep level about these things, and there's not much I can really contribute. But anyway, I was asked to say a few things. And in order to support my Dharma family, I will try to do what they asked. Um, I'm not really good at speaking in public, and I'm a little nervous, so please bear with me. I hope things I say might help us all strengthen our faith and give some encouragement to focus on practice. As Rinpoche always made very clear, this is the most important thing and the only way to truly obtain the results of the blessings he generously bestowed upon us and the very best way to repay his kindness. To speak of Rinpoche's compassion, generosity, skill, and determination is not to extol the praises of our Lama and think to place him above other Lamas. It's to venerate and cherish this amazing Bodhisattva we have been so fortunate to encounter in the very flesh and to be inspired to follow his example and to never lose touch with his wisdom blessings that will continue to guide us to liberation. It is like he is a brilliant sun, shining ceaselessly in full radiance, filling all space. If for a moment our curtain is pulled back, we are flooded with his pure light, just completely direct and unimpeded, always ready at all times, if we allow for a moment. Rinpoche worked for sentient beings' benefit his whole entire life. He could benefit others effortlessly through just being there, displaying his characteristic luminous smile, poking and joking around, casting an elegant gesture, not to mention some exquisitely comical and provocative ones at that. <laughs> or he might just say a few words that became our mantras, like, don't make a big deal. My friend John Potts back there, for whom I'm forever grateful, was the one who encouraged me to meet Rinpoche for the first time in 1988. Johnny would chant it as a potent mantra. Om, no big deal, Hong Pet. Om, no big deal, Hong Pet. In Rinpoche's display of effortlessness, during a building project, he might saunter up to check on how things are going, and then you'd notice he'd slipped off to the side, his long floral silken sleeves streaming and fluttering as he wielded a pickaxe that was about the same size as himself, <laughs> that he had sort of casually picked up off the ground, and he'd start breaking up some rock or the hard Colstein clay swinging it with perfect aim. His mala still in hand, the beads clanging against the handle as he heaved it gracefully and precisely. But it was not always a display of effortlessness. 
Rinpoche also worked hard to benefit beings, expending tremendous exertion and exhibiting untold patience. Through his relentless efforts, one could see what it takes and be compelled to participate alongside him. Taken in and delighted by his playfulness and wit, one would feel the grind of samsara just lighten up. In this way, Rinpoche inspired others to also work for the very same purpose, benefiting beings. He always knew how to blend learning, training, practice, and building together. Sometimes even training students in areas that became their working careers in things like carpentry and accounting and design and healing arts. He was so kind to us. Rinpoche always demonstrated what it meant to serve the Dharma and his teachers by fulfilling their prophecies and wishes no matter what struggle he had to go through personally. He emphasized, I am just a servant. Since he arrived in North America, all of his efforts were to plant the seed of Dharma and establish a stable foundation for it to flourish for future generations in this land where there had only been a trace of Buddha Dharma before his arrival in the early 1970s. It was not easy to gather funds, but Rinpoche applied himself to find the necessary money to begin the process of building Tashi Chuling in the Wild West hippie lands where donations were slim, but those who gathered could work hard and join in fulfilling his aspirations. And Sangi, she was right there helping him at each phase. Slowly, slowly, stage by stage, as he would often say, calming our frustrations and expectations about fast results. He built the most elegant and refined supports of the Dharma in many places, especially at Tashi Chuling and here at ODD and also in Ensenada, Mexico, the majestic Tara that graces a hill overlooking the city. In this way, he brought the tradition to this land. He provided the way for us to directly connect to the blessings of the lineage and have open access to every perfect source of enlightened form, speech, and mind to engage with, with and seek refuge in. Through his enlightened activity, the blessings are now here forever, and the Vajrayana is firmly established for all those who will follow. Rinpoche also printed and disseminated many pages to Dharma centers and lamas and created an archive for future generations. Rinpoche traveled across the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Taiwan, just wherever there was interest in Dharma. And he taught, gave empowerments, and shared advice. In fact, he knew his way around every place I ever went with him. And that included national parks and remote areas, as well as big cities. Sometimes driving the precious Rinpoche, I was quite anxious, driving in the fast-moving traffic of a foreign place. When he wanted to suggest a turn right or left, he would abruptly knock on the window, which did a number on my nerves and did not help me to know where to turn at all. <laughs> he would then give more directions. Go that mountain. After a while, slowly valley inside go under, then giant red one, close to there. <laughs> Showing me in his cupped hand as if it were a 3D map. He was pointing in the right direction, all right, but it didn't tell me anything about what exit to take off the freeway. And it probably would have been good directions if I was riding a horse. <laughs> Thank you.
Rinpoche brought many of the greatest masters of our time to us. He gathered and stretched the means to host these lamas when students did not understand what providing for great lamas could entail. He was always extremely careful about offerings he received. Whether it was large or small, he made sure to utilize funds in the most conscientious manner. Like Isla said a few days ago in her talk, he never wasted anything and always dedicated it as offerings to the Three Jewels. And speaking of the purse, you may know that he loved to go through women's purses <laughs> or anyone's handbag. He had such curiosity. Oh my, <laughs> oh my God, he would just dive in and um, begin inspecting with no apology. <laughs> and if you looked uncomfortable or protested at all, what is problem? Why need to hiding? Let's say. One time he sneakily filled one guy's backpack with rocks. I think it was to demonstrate the heavy psychological weight this guy was carrying around. Um, when the guy picked up the bag and noticed it seemed heavy, he opened it and saw the rocks and he just broke out laughing. He knew exactly who put it there. There was no question. <laughs> and he got the message immediately. Like Rinpoche would say to wrap up the point, no further more questions, Your Honor. Somehow, Rinpoche skillfully hid his qualities and accomplishments. Given his magnetism and charm, it is a mystery how he controlled the adoring crowds and how he accomplished so much so quietly. Rinpoche did not promote himself, as Sangi had mentioned, and he would thwart efforts of eager disciples to attempt to do so. He interacted with disciples in intimate settings in a way where students could make a very personal connection. One time in Hawaii, Savan set up a meeting with Melissa Matheson, um, the highly accomplished screenwriter who was married to Harrison Ford. She was interviewing Rinpoche as a consultant for her film, Kundun. She was seeking Rinpoche's personal reflections about what it was like during that time period in Tibet to be recognized as a tulku and how it had impacted him as a young boy. During the interview, he sidestepped all of her questions. He refused to speak about himself. He just praised His Holiness and emphasized the great benefits of doing a film about the Dalai Lama. And it happened another time when a filmmaker asked him to be in a PBS series she was doing about the universe. They seated him on the set and started shooting. Rinpoche refused to follow the script <laughs> and instead talked right past the cameras to the film crew and asked about who they were and about their lives, and <laughs> making them talk and laugh and filling them with awe and a mixture of confusion and delight. So he did not use these opportunities to promote himself or reach a wider audience. He chose a smaller audience, the ones right in front of him, right then. He was always humble, and I was struck by this early on when I saw how other lamas interacted with him. He would instruct me on how to prepare and how to serve a lama who would be coming. He would praise them and speak of their qualities, tell me how to revere them and why. But once they arrived, I would then see that it was he they were holding in high regard and I began to get more perspective on who he was, and a bit embarrassed 
about how we had been just so casual with him. <laughs> As we know, Rinpoche bestowed many teachings on all levels of Buddha Dharma with masterful translations by Sangi Khandro and also Lama Alan Wallace. He provided a thorough foundational education in Dharma for so many, especially his most diligent younger students, such as Shashi, Ayla, and Keith, who have become excellent translators, Chupins, and Umze. He carefully nurtured us, nurtured us all and then imparted honor and opportunity by giving us important responsibilities, such as the ever-devoted Ani Baba, who continually serves Rinpoche by maintaining the daily recitations and offerings to the protectors for all of Rinpoche's Dharma centers. He also guides a beautiful group of students who sought monastic ordination, each of them echoing Rinpoche's low-key style with devotion and commitment. True renunciates, such as Ani Rio, Ani Baba, Nick O'Connor, Jampal, Ani Yeshe, Ani Nima, Ani Lekshe, Ani Tsultrim, and others. One of his foremost ordained disciples was Lama Yeshe, who was quite skilled in ritual arts and became a very good teacher, especially on the topic of Kierun. <clears throat> Big Bird, or Jumbo Jet, <laughs> had a wonderful laugh that just boomed through the temple. Rinpoche requested important empowerments from authentic lineage holders on several momentous occasions. He also facilitated other masters teaching extended cycles of the highest pinnacle, namely the Heart Essence teachings with Kenshin Namdral Rinpoche, which occurred through the dedication, aspiration, and most exceptional translations of Sangi Khandro and Lama Chunam. Rinpoche happily said several times in recent years with firm conviction that the Dzogchen tradition will flourish in America. He said it will spread everywhere. Rinpoche reiterated again and again, really his main message in recent years, be harmony. And during these most sacred seven or eight weeks, we have been together and experiencing harmony. We've had many different students and lamas coming and going, making decisions as we have gone along and pulling together in no planned way. Different levels of experience, knowledge and perspectives, different emotions swirling about. Yet everyone has respected one another and worked for the same purpose without personal egos and agendas. It has truly been a beautiful and loving harmony among the entire Sangha as we hold one another together as one mandala with Rinpoche at the heart center. We can see how harmony really is possible even for us difficult, hard-headed Buddhists. We see how it frees us and feel the blessing. We will maintain harmony, Rinpoche. Now we know. I wish to personally thank all of you for supporting Rinpoche's activity, one another, and supporting me. People have lovingly spoken of my devotion for Rinpoche and caring for him for so long, but there is no way I could have done my part without you. 
All our actions and intentions are completely intertwined. Those of us living together for many years doing our best to care for Rinpoche, I think we really learn to be open to our varied styles and acknowledge and appreciate our different relationships with Rinpoche and to cherish one another's gifts. And it wasn't always easy because we too have lots to purify. Especially in these mass last many years, my sisters, Shashi and Isla, worked so, so hard, paying utmost attention to Rinpoche's every need. They both brought him so much joy and offered every comfort for him 24 hours a day. Their parents, Jeannie and Tony, also very devoted students, supported them from afar, cheerfully holding them up. Sangi and Chuna, despite their many responsibilities and engagements, were often with us, doing any household task, no matter what it was. And so some of us could take a little rest. When Rinpoche was sleeping, they would continue their translation translation work at the dining room table. And they were always there to give understanding advice and encouragement. They brought freshness to the scene. They made Rinpoche happy. They would spend long afternoons sitting with him, gazing through the big window, chanting mantra, basking in timeless time. Lama Drime Rinpoche was steady and clear-minded, and his cooking was Rinpoche's favorite. The best. Real Gyalrong food. <laughs> Rinpoche could be quite hard on him, being his uncle Rinpoche and all, but you could see how he was so pleased every time he came. And Rinpoche loved to recall memories of all his relatives, and also of the holy practitioners who blessed sacred places in Gyalrong, and Lama Jigme, who had been a long-time attendant from earlier times and supported us for many, many years in that way. He would come with the glow of his discipline and practice apparent, and of course, his familiar warmth. And of course, I want to mention my partner, Ben, who taught me so much about caregiving and often quietly attended Rinpoche as well as serving as his physician. Rinpoche called him a compassion person. Samantha would come often too, even though she shoulders so much responsibility tending to all things Tashi Chuling. <clears throat> She was a caring listener and hard worker, filling the house with the scent of her nurturing broths on the stove. She would slide into the routine so seamlessly that it seemed to Rinpoche that she just lived with us all the time. She and Rinpoche also collaborated on bringing up the fun quotient. Before the pandemic, Angie would drive up from the city and give Rinpoche long massages and she and Jan were always available to assist with just about anything we asked. Lindy came frequently, helped with cleaning and shopping, and ironed Rinpoche's clothes to perfection. Often Les came too, and he and Rinpoche would converse in their special language. There were so many of you, others too, I mean really, I personally could not have managed without you. As we move forward, I know we will continue to support Rinpoche's vision together and come to realize how blessed we are to have one another, to be disciples of Gyatral Rinpoche. At the conclusion of this occasion, all of us Sangha 
we wish to express our appreciation for the presence of so many wonderful lamas. Today we are especially fortunate to welcome Kenshin Sewang Gyatso Rinpoche, also known as Kempo Guru, who Rinpoche placed much trust in. So often over the years, Rinpoche would remind us again and again to be sure to learn from him as much as possible. His presence is truly auspicious on this concluding day of the practice. We have much gratitude for the presence of our beloved Lingfu Rinpoche, for being here as often as his health would allow. He has always been there to support Rinpoche's most important practice retreats and remaining so humble and accessible to the students. We thank Chulku Jigme Wangdrak Rinpoche for returning again for these last days. Your humble and merry presence has brought hope to us, especially for the future edification of the Dujum Tersar lineage. And we look forward to deepening our connection with you. Again, we are moved by the presence of Anyan Rinpoche sharing his very genuine and inspiring words. And we also recognize how difficult it was for him to take time away from his own center program during Holy Sagadawa. For two weeks, we had the amazing good fortune to have Nam Gyaldrawa Rinpoche presiding and sharing his heartfelt solace. And we are so happy to see Lama Allen and Vesna here today. Lama Allen has just engaged in a long retreat, which he recently completed. Though not here physically for these ceremonies, he has been present and focused with us in his heart and mind, offering beautiful prayerful remembrances of Rinpoche to his students and sharing widely online. Sangi Khandro and Lama Chunam here just doing everything possible to uplift the entire gathering, greeting and hosting everyone, lamas and students, sharing their wisdom and experience with teachings and stories, and fully engaged in the flow of the practice. Lama Jigme here serving Rinpoche and the Sangha with body, speech, and mind, not hesitating to step in and offer beautiful chanting resounding with deep faith. And Keith, also leading the recitation with perfection. Amplifying our devotion through his gorgeous melodic chanting of the prayer to the root teacher. Lama Sonam Sering Rinpoche and Lama Drime Rinpoche are not here today but both of them have been absolutely vital to each phase of this occasion. Lama Sona focused day and night, attending to every detail, taking utmost responsibility to see that everything has been carried out in the most auspicious manner in accord with Rinpoche's wishes. He also gently bestowed poignant advice that we will never forget about the importance of this time and how to keep the Samaya of pure view with our Dharma family. Lama Drime has also worked diligently and maintained a sense of calm and care. He also imported, imparted important teachings, motivating deeper authenticity in our practice. Thank you to all the Lamas for your steady presence, upholding the practice and sharing your heart's wisdom with us. Joining us in devotion to Rinpoche. All of the Sangha who have worked so hard, thank you. The Chipmans, Umzits, tea and soak servers, cooks, carpenters, seamsters, drivers, garbage collectors, 
organizers, planners, sponsors, board members, attendants, cleaners, dishwashers, flower arrangers, and shoppers. All of you just overflowing with offerings of body, speech, and mind, supporting a most wondrous time of powerful blessing on this very sacred occasion of Rinpoche's Parinirvana. <laughs>